This video was inspired by a true story, so to speak. A few days ago, I decided to give my student the choice to play one of two different sarabands. The objective behind this being that when one sees block chords in Baroque music, one should never play them as block chords, but rather arpeggiate them in all sorts of different ways, depending on the context. So I decided I picked two different sarabands. One was the saraband from the fourth English suite by Bach, and the second saraband was one in B minor by Louis Couperin. If you're interested, this is the saraband number 51 in the Loiseau Lyre edition, and you're going to see the score in, in a few minutes anyway. So um, I presented both of the sarabands to the student, played them as best as I could, and to my very pleasant surprise, the student decided to choose and play the Louis Couperin Sarabande. Um, in many respects, I say I was pleasantly surprised because Bach tends to be the safe choice, and I was very happy that the student decided to go against the grain, so to speak, and choose the much more unknown Sarabande from an unknown composer, somebody that she had never played before. Um, however, what I wanted to really talk about in this video is that um, in many cases we tend to give students repertory that a lot of people know and a lot of people play. And valuable as that repertory may be, it's not always necessarily the best choice. Now, if we look at the two sarabands, and the, the Bach saraband, as I said, is from the fourth English suite, so it's very easy to find uh, the score to listen to a recording. Um, what happens with uh, both of these sarabands, the Bach and the Louis Couperin? As I said, one of the challenges is to look at the pieces, they're written as block chords, and um, the point being that you have to arpeggiate them in different ways. Now, one of the things that I always say about especially Baroque scores is that the worst thing that you can do is to literally play what you see on the page. This is, of course, true both for the Bach and the, for, for the Louis Couperin. However, there is a very basic difference, and to me, here's where it's much more desirable to actually examine the Louis Couperin. With the Bach, if you decide to arpeggiate the chords in different ways, then for the most part, if you play what you see on the page, you basically get the piece, I don't want to say right, but you get the piece. I mean, most pianists do that, and the piece sounds fairly okay, even if, of course, it's not exactly what Bach intended. Um, the reason behind this being that Bach tended to provide more information in his scores. As a matter of fact, he was criticized in 1739 by Johann Adolf Scheibe of providing too much information in his scores. And I would say if you look at the, at the uh, Saraband from the Fourth English Suite, Bach has given you enough information so that, yes, of course, one should still interpret the score in a, in a, in a different way from what you see on the page, but basically, all of the notes are there, um, a lot of the ornamentation is there. Bach has already given you a, a fairly good indication of what he wants. The same cannot um, be said of the Louis Couperin Sarabande, because here I would say we have to do quite a lot to bring the score to life. It's not simply a matter of arpeggiating the chords, um, it's because Louis Couperin really did not provide a lot of information. He left a lot of choices open to the performer, to the point that if you really just play what you see on the page, the piece is going to sound totally unconvincing. Um, I would like to demonstrate um, what I mean, and what I will do now is I would like to play while at the same time showing you the score, uh, since I don't have very sophisticated editing equipment, uh, please forgive the very awkward transition uh, between this and the playing. So here now you see the score of Louis Couperin Sarband, and let me try for a moment to simply play what I see on the page as much as I can. 
I don't want to arpeggiate the chords for now, just to show you how really empty the piece is, unless one does something with it. Now, as I said, one thing that a performer can do is to arpeggiate the chords, but this is still not going to get us completely to, I think, the expressive potential of the piece. There are all sorts of other choices to make here. Um, the arpeggiation is one thing. Then, of course, the question is, there are places where the piece seems to need more ornamentation. So the performer needs to decide right away where to add ornaments. Another issue here is the not in a gully, the unequal note values. How much unequally are we going to play the eighth notes in this score? So many, many different choices. Um, let me give you right now an idea of how at this moment I would actually play the piece. And notice that this goes far beyond simply arpeggiating the chords. There's a lot more that's going on here. So a very, very different um, interpretation than what you see on the page. Now, there is a second aspect that I find very, very engaging in this piece, and this is, of course, the harmonic content. So I want to draw your attention to the very beginning of this, and then I'll go back to my other discussion via another awkward transition. Notice that um, this piece is supposedly in D minor, but notice what happens in the beginning. We do not start in D minor at all. And actually, Louis Couperin is going to ease us into D minor in this way. So this is a very, very, very wonderful kind of harmonic experimentation on the part of Luc Prem, and something that I think is, is very, very fascinating in this piece. So that is a, a totally beautiful and very, very unexpected way of starting a piece. And in many respects, I would say this is the type of piece um, and the type of harmonic progression that one could keep in the back of their mind and when somebody mentions Wagner's innovations in the prelude to Tristan and Isolde kind of smile and say hey do you know the Saraband by Louis Couperin because I would say what Louis Couperin does here is is very very similar to actually what Wagner did in the 19th century and it's a very unique harmonic move and I would say this brings me to the other aspect of why I think this music should be performed a lot more often. We tend to think, unfortunately I would say, in music history in terms of great composers and we tend to think, okay, well, you know, we have these, these few great composers and then everybody else is of secondary importance. So we tend to concentrate very much on these composers and not really pay attention to anyone else. Now, I'm not going to argue here whether Louis Couperin or Bach is the better composer. This is precisely not my point. I'm not interested. Uh, what I'm interested at here is that Bach 
has written some very, very wonderful music, but Louis Couperin has written some equally very wonderful music. And I think it's a pity that we have these beautiful gems that are out there, and we always keep concentrating on only one aspect of Baroque performance, and very few composers, and we totally leave out all of this wonderful music. So I hope that um, what I was trying to express here becomes a little more clearer, that first of all, different composers present us with different performing challenges. So that if we concentrate on one composer, we kind of miss these challenges. And in many respects, what happens is that we have a very limited picture of that era. So to not know what was happening before Bach, for instance, and what was happening around Bach, is in many ways something that will impoverish our own interpretations of Bach's music. But the other thing is that when we concentrate on one composer, we really miss all of this other wonderful music that was written around that time and was written in a style that is different. You can't say that what Bach did has anything to do with Couperin, with Louis Couperin, and that it can in some way substitute that. Similarly, of course, Louis Couperin does not substitute Bach, but this is the point. Why can we not bring them on a more equal footing and enjoy the beautiful music that both of these composers, but in many respects, enjoy the, the beautiful music that so many Baroque composers have written and enjoy the unique challenges, the unique interpretive challenges that each one of these composers is bringing to the table. Um, this is what I wanted to say with this, uh, with this little video presentation. And what I would like to do now is I actually recorded a few years back this uh, Louis Couperin Sarabande. So now I would like to append to this video that performance. As always, thank you for watching.